I hope you all are comfortable. It's that time of year where you don't know whether to turn on the heater or the air conditioner. Even here, it's hard to figure out. I know that uh, we got asked by some, turn on the heater, some turn on the air conditioner. We have both running right now. I hope you all are comfortable. So. <clears throat> Hmm. How many of you got fired up by Chase's sermon this morning? When that aim, oh, that was so good. I, I think about, uh, and I, we've watched him grow over the years. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. And I see how Chase has really blossomed in his ability to do that. He accurately handles the word of truth, and he has nothing to be ashamed of in his uh, diligence in learning how to present God's word. Just so proud of him and the work that he is doing. I got to do something this morning. Did I look a little out of place this morning? I I was Cody Roberts this morning, and uh, I just went to John. I said, hey, if you need anything, I said, You're Cody Roberts. I said, okay, what's Cody doing? So I've done it, but I think it had to have been 15 years ago since I've served on the Lord's Supper. I enjoyed that. And so, uh, but the brothers were very helpful. They had to tell me, okay, how many plates do I grab? Where do I stand? Where do I go? They were, they were helping me the whole time. So, so it was a joy to get to do that. Homosexual misconceptions is what we're going to talk about. So if you'll grab a Bible and you can be turning to Matthew chapter 19 and, and get your notes out. I wanted, I, I usually come up with a, a cutesy title, but I wanted there to be no question in your mind what I was preaching about tonight. I wanted you to know right up front. I'm going to talk about homosexuality. And I want to give my, my sources to begin with. First of all, on uh, January the 12th of 2014, I preached on homosexuality as God sees it. That was eight years ago. And a lot has changed since then, and so there was need to, to address this subject again. I was sent a, a sermon online by a sister, by Don Backwell, called The Devil's New Favorite Sin, and so I'm going to borrow a lot from that. And then I also just finished reading a book that was edited by Mike Maslow. He didn't write it. There were many writers. and He brought it all together and put it in book form. And it's called Gay Rights or Wrongs. There actually is a free copy on the uh, uh, credenza back there in the foyer. One free copy. So if you get there first, you get it. Actually, if you miss it, let me know. I'll see what I can do for you. I've got an inside source on that now. But uh, good book. Very good book. It's outdated a little. I'll just tell you that front. A lot has changed since they, he edited it and compiled that book. But a lot of good stuff in there about the AIDS and the HIV and how we reacted to all that and what was real and what wasn't. Now looking back, you know, in hindsight at that whole uh, situation. But uh, things have really changed uh, in the world. I'm going to put up here a poll by the Washington Post. They did an independent poll from 2004 to 2014 asking this question, do you think it should be legal or illegal for gay and lesbian couples to get married? And when this poll was first started in 2004, there was 41% who was saying that it should be legal. And 55 were saying, no, that should be illegal. And then for those who thought it should be legal, it dipped way down for a while and then kind of came back up. And then they were kind of together 2009 to 2011. And then in 2013, it says 58% believe that it should be legal. Politicians watch this stuff, I guarantee you. They watch this very closely because that's what it's about. They, they want to please the people. And so they want to know what the polls are saying. And... Uh, as I look at this, and I think it was about, it was 2011 when the House of Representatives overturned the military's policy, don't ask, don't tell. That was a real popular thing with the military for a long time, and the House of Representatives uh, overturned that. It was passed by the Senate December 18th of 2011. And you can kind of see where that's when things really started to shift, the paradigm started to shift, and then 
in 2014, there was a Rose Bowl parade wedding. So on January 1st, that's always when the Rose Bowl is, there was a wedding that day, and that's probably what prompted me to do my sermon uh, two weeks later on this subject. And then we all know what happened in, the, in 2015. Homosexuals were granted full marriage equality by the Supreme Court June 26, 2015, Oberfell uh, versus Hodges. In a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court ruled that the 14th Amendment requires that all 50 states both license marriage for same-sex couples and recognize licenses for same-sex marriages that are issued out of state. That was 2015, seven years ago. Since then, sitcoms, soap operas, uh, I'm told even Hallmark now is promoting homosexual agenda, school curriculums, publications, other social influences are preaching this uh, tolerance of same-sex relationships. And it's time that we kind of talk about this and talk about what we are to do as Christians and, and where we stand on all this. And as I was studying it, and I've prayed hard about this sermon, I want you to know, and I've studied this as carefully as I can, I'm going to try to present it as honestly as I can. I see nine misconceptions when it comes to homosexuality that I want to address. And the first one is, is this one. Homosexuals have the right to be married. That, I'm just going to tell you right up front, that is a misconception conception. That is not true. Why is that not true? The problem is they're not married. They're not married. The Supreme Court is not the Supreme Court. There is a higher court still. The Supreme Court did not create marriage. And the Supreme Court does not have the right to decide who is married and who's not. And neither do you or I. The one who created marriage is the one who gets to decide. In Matthew chapter 19, hopefully you're there now, and verse 6 says, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now you look at that verse and tell me who does the joining. It is certainly God that does the joining. The Bible defines marriage as a union between a man and a woman. And if God doesn't join them, they're not joined. In Genesis chapter 2, let me show you this verse. This is in your notes. And by the way, I'm going to give a lot of scriptures that I couldn't cram in your notes. So you can uh, write on the back or whatever you want if you want to keep track of these. But Genesis 2.21 says, So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then took one of his ribs and closed up the place the Lord God made or the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which she had taken from the man and brought her to the man and the man said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. That's the pattern that we see. God was the one who instituted marriage. God alone decides what real marriage is, and there's nothing that any court or any group of people could do to change that. So going back to the scripture there in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 6, it says, what God has joined together, let man not separate. God is the one who decides. The problem with saying that homosexuality or homosexuals have the right to marry is that they are not married. Here's the second misconception. All sins are the same. Homosexuality is no worse than other sins. Now, the problem with this misconception is, is that there is some truth to that. If we're talking about as far as separating us from God. When it comes to separating us from God, there's no such things as big sins and little sins. Sin is sin. And any sin can keep you out of heaven. So if we just look at that aspect, the statement is true. 
And what we learn from this is that when you, if you have a, a uh, horrific attitude towards those who are homosexual and you think they're in a whole different category, no, they're not. They're sinners. They need to repent of their sins just like you and me. In that sense, they're the same. But sins have different consequences. And so let's look at some scripture on this. John chapter 19, let's turn there. The context is Jesus is talking with Pilate. And Pilate has said, man, don't you understand what I could do to you? Don't you understand this authority that I have over you? And in verse 11, Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. The greater sin. That means there are some sins that are greater than others as far as consequences, as, as far as blood guiltiness to the person. What Jesus is basically telling Pilate is, yeah, you're sinning. <laughs> you're sinning right now. But the one that handed me over to you, my friend, who betrayed me for 30 pieces of silver, he committed a greater sin. And so some sins are greater than others. Some sins God hates more than others. Look at the book of Proverbs in chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 says, There are six things which the Lord hates. Well, I thought God hated every sin. Oh, he does. There are six that really kind of get his, get his dander up. He has seven which are an abomination to him. And so the Bible says there are some that God hates more than others. There are some sins that God hates more than others. Not, sins are not equal in that level. As far as whether we go to heaven or not, yeah, or separating us from God, they're equal. But when it comes to consequences on earth and the, the, uh, the guiltiness before God and how God views sin, some sins are worse than others. And then that, that last scripture there in 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, beginning of verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will forgive him or will give him life to those who commit a sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. So there are sins which lead to death, and there are sins which don't lead to death, and I don't have time to study that with you right now. That's for another sermon. But what I want you to get out of this is not all sins are the same. Some sins are more horrific in the sight of God. Is homosexuality one of those? Well, look at the book of Romans chapter 1. Read with me, please, starting in verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error some translations say for their perversion and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer God gave them over to a depraved mind to do things which are not proper and then he goes on to list many other sins but look at the way that he talks about the sin of homosexuality from God's word it is clear that God does not like this sin. How many of you think that robbing banks is an is a evil thing to do, a wrong thing to do? Would you agree? That is a terrible thing. Robbing banks is a terrible thing to do. What if we made it legal? Would that make it better? If it became legal to rob banks in the United States... Would you still think it was immoral, still think it's wrong? I would. Does that mean I'm intolerant? Does that mean I'm a bad person? No, I don't think so. I just have a standard of right and wrong, 
I'm trying to align that with God's standard of right and wrong. Sin is sin as far as separating us from God. But there are sins that God say, he says they're abominable. They're not good. Number three, let's, let's talk about this one. Here's a misconception. The Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. This has actually been said by many today. Well, it's been a big misunderstanding. The Bible really doesn't speak out against homosexuality. It's really not a sin. Well, the best way to answer this question is to use what? The Bible. So let's look at what the Bible says. Again, I'm going to put up some scriptures that aren't in your notes. Leviticus 18.22 says, You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. Also, you shall not have intercourse with any animal to be defiled with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It is a perversion. Now, I didn't have to put verse 23 in there. 22 covers it, but I put that in there for a reason. I want you to see how God feels about the sin of homosexuality in God's word. Leviticus 20, verse 13. If there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. Let me give you another scripture here. Ezekiel chapter 16. Let's turn to that one. This is a scripture that's used to show that there was a big misunderstanding about Sodom. Uh, Sodom's sin was really not homosexuality, that's not why God was angry at Sodom, it was other things. And turn to Ezekiel chapter 16 and they'll read verse 49, which says, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food and careless ease, but they did not help the poor and the needy. There you go. People say that's really what the problem was with Sodom, is they were arrogant and they weren't helping out the needy. And so that's why God destroyed Sodom. Well, anytime you hear a scripture like that, and that doesn't sound quite right, read the context and look at verse 50, what it says. Thus they were haughty and committed what? Abomination before me, therefore I removed them when I saw it. It was the abomination. And I just showed you Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, which says that homosexuality is an abomination. That's why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, let's just put that scripture up here. Let's just look at it together, and you can follow along in your Bible if you want. But Leviticus 19, or excuse me, Genesis 19, verse 1 says, Now to the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, as Lot was sitting in the gate at Sodom. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. They said, however, no, but we shall spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered into his house, and he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city the men of Sodom surrounded the house, both young and old, and all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot, and they said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may have relations with them. That's what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Bring those men out so we may have relations with them. Now, if you wonder what relations mean, let me give this to you in five different translations. The Bible in basic English says, and crying out to Lot, they said, where are the men who came to you tonight? Send them out to us so that we may take our pleasure with them. The Christian Standard Bible says, send them out to us so that we can have sex with them. The English Standard Version says, bring them out to us that we may know them. The King James says something very similar to that. But the New King James says, bring them out to us so that we may know them carnally. The New International Reader's Version, <clears throat> which is written at the third grade reading level. I need that once in a while. 
They called out to Lot. They said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us. We want to have sex with them. There's no question what was the sin of Sodom. A city that God totally destroyed because of their abomination. Because what they were doing was abominable. Is it really that the Bible condemns homosexuality? Some say, well, what about Jesus? Now, Jesus never really condemned homosexuality. The argument goes kind of like this. <clears throat> Jesus never said a word about homosexuality. As our model for life, we should follow the example of Jesus' silence. He taught live and let live. As long as people love, it doesn't matter what they do. That's kind of how the argument goes. Here's the problem with that. <clears throat> Silence does not mean that Jesus approved of homosexuality. He never specifically condemned pedophilia or bestiality either. And yet, we would agree those are sins. Jesus always spoke of heterosexual relationships. And then another scripture here that I want to put up that... Sometimes we don't talk about, we always just assume, okay, well, yeah, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. Mark 7, verse 21 says, From within, out of men's hearts, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries. Do you know what the word fornications actually means? Here's the Greek word, pornea. That word means sexual activity outside of marriage, as God defines marriage. So anytime there's sexual activity outside of marriage, Jesus condemns it. Homosexuality, bestiality, and pedophilia would all fall in that category. In a way, Jesus did say something about this sin. All right? Does the Bible condemn homosexuality? Yes, it does. Homosexual, homosexuality is a sin. And it needs to be repented of. And in the book that I've mentioned to you, Gay Rights and Wrongs, I really do wish you'd pick up that book because in there are the testimonies of a lot of prior homosexuals who came to Christ, who were able to overcome their backgrounds. A lot of people say, oh, that's just the way they are. They'll never change. Uh, always the same way. No, but they did find out in order to repent of homosexual, you have to leave not only the homosexual behavior, you have to leave, number two, the identity. You have to stop calling yourself a homosexual. And then thirdly, you need to leave the lifestyle, the way we dress, talk, act. Although most homosexuals, you can't tell by looking at them that they're homosexuals, right? That's kind of a, a stereotype. Uh, we have in our mind what a homosexual does and how they act and how they dress, and yet most practicing homosexuals don't act and dress that way. Just so you know, lots of misconceptions. But one is this misconception that saying the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality, that's, that's wrong. It clearly condemns homosexuality. Let's talk about this next one, number four, this misconception. Well, the Bible says not to judge. You know, we're not supposed to be a judge. We should just be accepting of this. We just need to, to go with it, these, these poor Folks who have just been uh, oppressed, and uh, we're not supposed to judge. You know that scripture comes from Matthew chapter 7. And so let's look at that together. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. Jesus is the one who said this. In verse 1, he says, Do not judge, so that you will not be judged. And so they're right. Jesus does say that. But let's go on to read the context. Verse 2 says, for in the same way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye and do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will 
trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. This is the context of verse 7 where he says next, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. We're told that the Bible says not to judge, and it does. It says not to judge, but he's talking about a specific way of judging. He's talking about a kind of judging where you're judging other people about their little tiny speck in their eye, and you got a plank hanging out of your own eye. By the way, you think Jesus didn't have a sense of humor. Just vision that for a little bit. Jesus had a good sense of humor. He knew how to drive a point home. That's the kind of judging that is wrong. It's hypocritical judging. He says, don't do that. But you know that in John chapter 7 and verse 24, it says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Same man, Jesus said those words. The same man says, don't judge this way. He says, I want you to judge, but use righteous judgment when you judge. Yeah, John chapter 7 verse 24 is one you want to hang on to. Keep that one around. What do they mean when they say, well, you can't be judging people? Does that mean that we're not supposed to use judgment? Is that really what we're supposed to do? No. We need to take the, the whole Bible on this subject. We need to not condemn people when we ourselves haven't cleaned our own backyard. That's Matthew chapter 7. But John 7 says, I want you to use righteous judgment when you judge. We have to make a judgment about things. We have to be intelligent enough to say this is right and this is wrong and nothing's going to change that. Something that I think would help a lot of the younger people in here because I know you've had this pounded in your brain, tolerance, 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 your whole life. Just 32 years ago, I was I was wanting to do a master's in counseling. The only place to go was Denver Baptist Theological Seminary. That's the only place close enough to me to go. So I went and enrolled in a master's in counseling program there. If you are going to be a counselor, you have to get this book. This is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. This is the third edition revised, so it's the DSM-3R. This is the very same book that, that I was taught from. This is printed by the American Psychiatric Association out of Washington, D.C. This is the handbook that every counselor used at that time. They're now up to the DSM-5, I believe. Uh, it's, it's been revised a couple times. This book lists homosexuality as a mental disorder and talks about how to classify it and how to work with somebody who is homosexual, who's wanting to come out of that lifestyle. The DSM-4, which came out, I believe, in 1984, does not have homosexuality in it. What's interesting about that is there was no empirical test done to change that. There was no new evidence that was presented. Oh, well, we've discovered that this actually isn't a mental disorder. Nothing like that. It was purely political pressure and nothing else that changed that. And so if you're a young person, uh, born in the last 32 years, we'll say, okay, you may not understand what some of us were taught at one time and how this has changed. And so maybe that will help you to understand how we're, we're struggling a little bit with accepting some of this stuff, but are we really being the ones that are being judgmental? Did you know Chick-fil-A has been banned, banned from the San Antonio airport because the city of San Antonio vetoed Chick-fil-A or they're boycotting Chick-fil-A because of their position on homosexuality. They're lost. That's some really good chicken, let me tell you. That's, <laughs> they're missing out. But, but uh, who really is being intolerant here? I want to do something else. and I want you to get out your cell phone. Okay, now if you left the cell phone in the, in the car, that's a good idea. But if, bring out your cell phone and pull up a text message. I want to check something that I just discovered this week. You're not going to send the text message, so it doesn't matter who it's to. But I want you to type in the word homosexual, but I want you to do it very slowly. H-O-M-O, 
S. And as you're doing it, watch the spell check at the bottom and see if the word pops up. It did not on my phone. You know how a spell check will pop up a lot of words, and, and so you can just click on it and put that up there. Notice it doesn't come up. It didn't on mine. Maybe it does on yours, okay? Maybe that word came up, but it didn't come up on my phone. Why? They don't want you to use the word. Homosexual, to even say the word, which I've said probably, what, 30 times already? That's not even politically correct to say. You're supposed to say same sex, relationships, or gay, or lesbian. That's a politically correct way to say it. Even our language is, is being boycotted. Uh, the intolerance is really not with us, <clears throat> or it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. All right. I beat that enough. Let's go on to the fifth misconception here. God made them that way. This is another very popular thing that you're hearing. Well, how can we condemn this when God made them that way? That some people are just born homosexual. There's nothing they can do about it. That's the argument that's given. It's interesting. Let me put a slide here. The gay gene studies that was done by eight independent regions of the United States, just to make sure there was no bias. What they did was they took identical twins, and they found out which ones, if one twin was homosexual. And if they did, what were the odds that the other one was homosexual? And what they found out was among the male twins, if one was homosexual, the other was 11% likely to be homosexual. And for, for the women, if the, the uh, one was homosexual, the other, the twin was 14% likely to be homosexual. Dr. Neil Whitehead <clears throat> was kind of in charge of this research. He gathered this all up, and they were wanting to, to prove, you know, once for all, what about this gay gene? Does it exist? Here's his conclusion. If an identical twin has the same sex attraction, the chance a co-twin has it are about 11% for men and 14% for women. The predominant things that create homosexuality in one identical twin and not in the other have to be post-birth factors. It says it has to be. 11% likely? I also read the other side of this, and I always do that. I want to read what the opposition is saying. And there was a, a, a rebuttal to this, and they said, that is not accurate because what's happened is the one that is a practicing homosexual, it's just that the twin has, has not come out of the closet yet. That was the answer. 89% <laughs> haven't come out. I mean, that's really, that's a viable explanation? That just doesn't even make sense. The evidence proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is not, there's no gay gene. Uh, another thing that I, I'm not even going to put up here, you can do some research on your own, but uh, look up Human Genome Project. This, this project started in 1998. It just got completed in May of 2021. This was an international event around the world. Geneticists, scientists worked on this for many years, trying to, to classify every single gene in the human body. They've done it. They've classified every single gene in the human body. Guess what? No gay gene. There is no gay gene. Science does not say that God made them that way. The Bible does not say that God made them that way. Look at Romans chapter 1 again. I don't know if you noticed this the first time when we looked at this passage, but in Romans chapter 1, go with me just one more time there, please. Look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to a degrading passions, for their women exchanged the what? The natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function for the woman and burned with their desire for one another. I don't know why people believe this. I really don't. The Bible doesn't teach it. Science doesn't teach it. There is no gay gene. They're not born that way. It is a choice. It is a choice to sin just like any other sin. All right. Let me go on to number six. 
This is kind of a, an, a yeah, let's, let's skip this one. Number six, we don't have to stay male or female. We choose. You know, Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, says God made us male and female. And this one is in our DNA, by the way. If you have an X and a Y chromosome when you're born, you are male. If you have an X and an X chromosome when you're born, you are female. And you can do anything you want to your body and take as many hormones and, and uh, chemicals as you want. It doesn't change the fact. We are male or female. All right, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that one. Number seven. This is just the modern-day civil rights movement. This is another misconception. You know, we've had civil rights movements. Uh, uh, the African-American had to, to push for their rights, and, and women and their rights had to push for rights, and this is just another one of those civil rights movements. Well, the problem with that is that skin color is not a choice, and gender is not a choice, as I just explained. Homosexuality is a choice. It is a choice whether to obey God or to disobey God. This is not a civil rights issue. This is an issue of right and wrong. Matthew 19.4 says, Have you not read that he who created you from the beginning made them male and female? And of course that's a quote from Genesis chapter 1 verse 7, 27. That we're made male and female. We have that as part of our genes. But homosexuality is, is a choice. All right. Uh, we're not infringing on their rights. They don't have the right to engage in sexual misconduct and call it marriage. That's not a right. Number eight. Let's look at this misconception. We're justified in being hateful and exclusive to homosexuals. All right. Let's talk about the other side of this issue. There's a big misconception about this. We do not have the right to say, you're excluded. You don't belong with us because of your sin. This kind of bigotry has destroyed the church, has destroyed our message. We need to change. I'm not giving you this information so you can go out and, and blast somebody with it. I'm giving this to you so you understand what the issues are and what the Christian position is on this, but it is our Christian position to welcome anybody into the Shakota Church of Christ. Amen. Anybody is welcome here, regardless of what their past is. And they're just as deserving of the grace of God as you and I are, which is this much, by the way. <laughs> None of us are deserving of the grace of God. In Romans chapter 14, I want to look at a passage here that Paul was dealing with a totally different subject. Uh, he had a church here in Rome that he's writing to, and uh, Jews were looking down on Gentiles. And some were weak in their faith, and, and some were reacting different ways to the food sacrificed idols. There were a lot of things going on. But look what he says in Romans chapter 14 and verse 1. Now, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Any sinner who wants to repent of their sins is welcome in the Lord's church, and you and I are in no position to say, you can't be a part of this. Nor are we in a position to say, you are, are suffering this terrible disease, and I'm thinking about AIDS and the HIV, and, and that's just God giving you your comeuppings. Really? That's our message? That is so wrong. That is so wrong to use that, say, well, see, this is God just punishing you. You don't know that. You really don't know that. Our, our message needs to change there. You know, uh, I'm cutting stuff out of the sermon because I know I'm going too long. Uh, 
Let me just share this story with you. I've got to tell you. In 1991, I was working. I had a vocal cord injury, and I couldn't preach for a while, and I did home respiratory care. I got a call to go down to the hospital. They told me we have an AIDS patient that is, has got stranded in our town. He cannot go on. He, uh, he has, his AIDS is so bad, and his, uh, it's scarred his lung tissue so bad that he can't breathe without oxygen, and he's run out of oxygen. And so he can't go home, basically, to Arizona without auction. So they called me. I came down. When I got there, this young man, I was 31 at the time. He was uh, probably eight years younger than me. Was sitting probably 40 feet away from anybody else. Nobody was near this guy. Off by himself. I walked in. The head respiratory therapist told me the situation. The first thing I did was walk over and shook that young man's hand. I said, I'm Curtis Hartshorn. How may I help you? Now, what's interesting about that story is Christ did that through me. Because before Christ, I'll guarantee you, I would not have done that. People think Christianity is hardening our hearts about things like this. No, it softened my heart. I helped that young man get what he needed. I helped him load the oxygen in the car. I, I took all his information. I shook his hand again. I said, I wish you the best. Hope you have a safe trip. Christ did that in me. Because when I was an atheist, I'll guarantee you, it was a whole different situation there. Since the day I became a Christian, well, really about five months after I became a Christian, I've had friends who are homosexuals. And they are my friends. And they know I care about them. I don't agree with their sin. I don't condone their sin. But they are my friends. All right, uh, let's look at, at number nine. We don't need to reach out to homosexuals because they can't change anyway. You know what? None of us are good enough. None of us are good enough to go to heaven. None of us are good enough to be a part of the Lord's church. We are here totally by the grace of God. And homosexuals can change. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we'll close out with this passage. Again, I, I encourage you to read that book if you get a chance by, that Mike Maslongo edited. And just read about these people who explain what they had to go through to change. But they have come out of the sin of homosexuality. They have repented of it. The Bible talks about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That tells us emphatically we cannot persist in a lifestyle of sin and expect to inherit the kingdom of God. We must repent of our sins. But here's the encouraging part, verse 11. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. There were members of the church there in Corinth who used to be drunkards, who used to be revilers, who used to be covetous, and who used to be homosexuals, and who used to be effeminates. You might want to look that word up and study that a little bit. Interesting word. They repented. What happened to them? They were washed. They were sanctified. They were justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Anybody can repent of their sins. Anybody. I hope this has been helpful to you. I, I hope it's, uh, it's shed some light on a very touchy subject. And I knew starting this sermon that you most likely have a relative who's homosexual. I know that. Uh, or a good friend, or somebody that you're close to. And I hope I've not offended you. And I, I, if there were some here today or watching this on our YouTube channel who are homosexual. I, I have no intention of offending you in any way. And I want you to know you're so welcome here at the Shakota Church of Christ. We would love to have you here. We are sinners as well. And we're struggling. We're just doing the best that we can. 
But calling your sin not a sin doesn't help you. It doesn't help you. Okay? We want to help you go to heaven. And the way we do that is we repent of our sins and we turn to God for the answers. And he answers and he does heal and he does comfort us. That's also why we offer the invitation, which we are about to do. We want to extend to anybody here the invitation to come to Christ. Our burdens can be lifted. They're lifted at Calvary. We're so grateful for the cleansing blood of Christ. If that's your desire to have your burdens lifted, please come as we stand and sing.